do let's uh let's kick off this uh online event and um yeah as i said i'm jerome bailly i'm a board a member of the crypto valley association welcome uh, everybody to this um online event uh dedicated to cyber cybersecurity for enterprise blockchain solution um as you know the heart of the crypto valley association uh is its working groups we have seven uh, different working groups within the association and it's really where the the members uh or members or individual members uh, or people gather to create um the real added value of the association uh this association crypto valley create many two main types of content uh, paper blueprints uh, with best practices and event online and on site and uh, today it's a really big day for our association because it's the first time that two different working groups work together um, the cybersecurity working groups and the enterprise blockchain working group uh, they work together to um, produce this uh, blueprint uh, on enterprise uh, blockchain solution cybersecurity. Um, and um, yes, thank you to every all contributor uh, that will be in this panel tonight. Um, also, thank you to the corporate members which made this uh, project possible, like uh, Anovum, Fortinet, Sizec, and Excellence. Um, yeah, if it's your first time uh, you attend a CVA online event, um, uh, enjoy, get the most of the panel. And of course, ask, don't hesitate to ask your question uh, during the interactive um, session. Um, and yeah, if you uh, find it useful for you, feel free to, to join on CryptoValet.Swiss. Everybody is, um, is welcome. And uh, yeah, now I hand it to, over to Marcus uh, Perdriza, who is... Uh, co-chair of the cybersecurity working group uh, to you, Marcus. There goes my first line, first line already. Thanks, Jerome. I'm Marcus Pedris, co-chair of the cybersecurity working group at Crypto Valley Association. The mission of our cybersecurity working group is to increase trust in crypto assets and blockchain through the development and publication of best practices. And when we got started three years ago, we laid out three main areas that we do this in. First, we published about the safety of digital assets, focusing on custody and private keys. Second, we released important in, uh, information about the security of decentralized applications, smart contract development. But it's always, we've never succeeded in actually doing something around secure blockchain applications. And finally, with the help of the Enterprise Blockchain Working Group. When we joined forces, we've had all of the know-how that it takes to release a secure cybersecurity best practice for enterprise blockchains. So here we are. Thanks everybody who contributed. And by the way, we are recording this session. I see a few people ask this in chat. Okay, thank you very much, Marcus. I take over. My name is Dennis Flood. I'm the chairman of the, the chair of the Enterprise Blockchain Working Group, and I'm very honored to uh, lead this panel tonight. And I feel as well very honored because we have today, except the one person who could not make it, all the authors of this um, blueprint that we did together uh, uh, today. And, um, and I quickly want to introduce everybody. We have on one side uh, 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 from um, Katarina uh, Lazotta Heller, who is uh, working um, at, as partner at uh, uh, Lexcellence, uh, uh, which is a, a legal company uh, for, for legal and compliance question, and is as well the president of the Swiss Polish Blockchain Association. Um, and we have uh, Natalie Linar with us, a security um, expert from the company SISEC, uh, which operates uh, computing solutions, enabling the um, uh, secure collaboration between uh, uh, companies in the cloud, uh, and including as well the protection of all this uh, data in, in the cloud environment. Then from our uh, partner, corporate partner at Novum, uh, we have Michel, uh, Sally, and Moritz Kuhn. Um, I think at Novum, no name as provider of consulting, uh, security consulting, software solutions, and uh, identity access management solutions here. 
and um, and Frederick uh, Malaga, um, partner at Fortinec. Uh, Fortinec, uh, an international provider for uh, security solutions in the borderless for borderless networks uh, for large enterprises, governments, and service providers. And last but not least, Gianluca Tordi uh, from from Italy, um, who is from uh, Alisi Gada, and uh, which is as well doing uh, compliance international regulation solutions in the blockchain space um, with us. They all contributed to the paper, and I'm very happy. So uh, you see in the chat as well the link uh, to the, the paper. It will be as well published tonight, actually, on the. Uh, on the uh, uh, Crypto Valley uh, website, and very good reading. But let's start with the panel discussions. And I would like to start with you, Frederick, and um, just ask you a little bit from, from your perspective. I mean, what are the key challenges in the enterprise uh, blockchain space concerning cybersecurity? Yeah, thank you, Dennis. Uh, happy to be here. So yeah, we see multiple multiple threats when it comes to enterprise blockchain. Uh, the first one, in terms of challenge, we see a, a real challenge when it comes to access control and privacy. Uh, we know that it's important that every participant in the blockchain must be protected from unauthorized access. So this this whole problematic of access control and privacy uh, is widely covered in the blueprint because uh, it's it's one of the the, the key challenge. The, the second challenge we see is about managing the keys. Uh, when we talk about blockchain, obviously we talk about uh, having the right crypto uh, capabilities to, uh, to ensure integrity. So here there is a whole topic when it comes to uh, securing the key management. We see also a, a challenge when it comes to a, a distributed denial of service, which is a type of attack which could compromise uh, the efficiency and the, the speed uh, of the blockchain uh, exchanging blocks along the chain. And that, last but not least, uh, it's more human factor here. Uh, when it comes to private blockchain uh, at the enterprise level, um, we see that uh, when, when hackers see that enterprise are uh, deploying this kind of uh, technology, it's, it's really a, a source of uh, interest for them trying to hack the system because they know that there are some uh, Let's say some interesting, interesting, um, uh, let's say interesting things behind the blockchain to be uh, to be broken. So four four areas where we see we see a real challenge here in terms of cyber security. Yeah, uh, thank you, Moritz and and Michel. You you co-authored actually a, a chapter um, on membership and identity management and. Uh, Freddie was just referring as well to that, that it's a key challenge in, in enterprise blockchain solutions. Um, what, what, you, what is your view on that? What are the, the challenges and uh, what is the, the difference between an enterprise blockchain solution and uh, a, a traditional public uh, blockchain? Let me take, let me answer that question, Dennis. Um, the, the basic difference is that participants in an enterprise blockchain solution um, have to be registered and identified. And that leads to a number of challenges. Um, quite obviously, uh, um, traditional identity management, and we have to manage these identities of, of the participants, uh, doesn't, doesn't work in, in such a solution. Um, a central identity provider is exactly what we don't want, um, but also a federated identity management um, does not scale, especially if you have many members. So we have to find a way to manage uh, identities in this, in this distributed system. Um, we also have to find a way um, how we distribute control over a common trust anchor. So we normally need in an enterprise blockchain solution, we need a trust anchor to start with. Um, and of course, we don't want to give control over this trust anchor to one party. We have to distribute that. And then we have to find a way to model and represent both membership as well as privileges um, in a way of distributed verifiable claims in such a system. 
I would say when it comes to identity management, these are the core problems um, we have to solve. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Katarina, um, you, you, you brought into the paper more the, the legal view, <laughs> which is as well uh, an important uh, uh, aspect to, to when we talk about uh, uh, security and, and, and cyber security, because that has always as well a touch to um, data protection <laughs> law, <laughs> the GDPR, uh, uh, the European General Data Protection Regulation is of course impacted in 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 by by uh, these uh, security aspects. So, can you please uh, tell us a little bit what your key findings concerning uh, GDPR and its impact on enterprise blockchain solutions uh, is? Thank you. Hello, everybody. Firstly, I need to say one thing. There is also um, another working group which is represented here today. It's not only enterprise, but also regulatory group where I'm from. So thank you very much for inviting me to join the, the panel and also to, to, to contribute by the, by the paper. And uh, in fact, I also chair task force in our regulatory um, working group, which is basically dealing with data, everything which is related to data, data protection. And um, before I will tell you a little bit what the, what the GDPR problems and challenges around uh, blockchain are, I want to make sure that we understand a few things. Firstly, when I'm we're talking about privacy in blockchain, I want uh, you to understand that we're talking about compliance requirements, which are put in certain data protection regulations and not necessarily talking today about privacy, which sometimes is invoked, especially in relation to cryptocurrencies, when certain people understand the way how they then protect their identity towards requirements of AML related regulation, like an anti-money laundering regulation. So we will be talking today about GDPR and issues or um, problems which are which which um, arise from the from the from 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 GDPR and data protection regulations. And then we need to understand four definitions which are very, very important to understand the whole idea. Firstly, we need to know what is data subject. Data subject is every natural person like you all guys and our guests uh, uh, today um, online whose data are basically uh, processed. Let's put it like this. So that's important because the data are protected by, the, by certain regulations. Second, we have definition which is called data controller. is somebody who defines the purpose of why the data shall be processed. That's important as well. Second, we have data processor. This is somebody or organization which process, processes the data on behalf of data controller. And finally, we have something what is called data and data, which is protected, which the GDPR is dealing with is personal data. It's basically the data which relates to any kind of information which identify um, or relates to every person which might be identifiable, basically. So those four definitions are very important to understand what we'll be talking about. When I told you we have this data controller, so it means that we have somewhere central function. And this is the first finding. We have clash between blockchain and GDPR requirements because GDPR requirements like every known data protection related regulations on the world um, in force now relates to kind of centric organizations, centric requirements. There must be somebody who is responsible for compliance. When in relation to blockchain is by definition, we have decentralized organization. And this is more true in relation to open, to public blockchain, and less true, I would say, or maybe that's not the wrong, the right um, uh, term, but it's it's a little bit different situation in enterprise-based blockchain when we have somebody who, as um, Frederick said at the beginning, we have situation that we have registered users, meaning somebody letting those people in into this blockchain and somebody is executing some kind of governance about them. 
So there is the first finding there is tension between GDPR requirements and blockchain because one is centric, another is by definition decentric, but it's a little bit different than in, in relation um, to, to, um, to um, blockchain enterprise based blockchain. Then we have issue of jurisdiction where actually our nodes are located, which law shall we apply? Then we have issues which are related to so-called right to be forgotten. Is it really possible to erase data? Is it really possible that our that the personal data will disappear from the blockchain? Then the whole idea about blockchain is to make sure that the data will stay and nobody can decide outside of the consensus about basically erasing or deleting the data. So there are many, many different tensions, basically challenges, but still a um, very fascinating topic. And uh, let's see how the legislation will develop here. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Katrina. You, you, you mentioned something, uh, data and data protection and data security. I mean, one thing I found at this blueprint very interesting is that we looked at the cybersecurity uh, topic in enterprise blockchain solutions from a very different angles to it. Uh, and you had the data protection aspect and, and Januka actually was looking at a totally different aspect to it, which is as well important to cybersecurity, which is actually that how you bring in, especially in enterprise solutions, uh, the, the data into the blockchain. With enterprise blockchain solutions, it's always about transactions and exchanging uh, data. Uh, mm -hmm between members in there but this data that is all you often as well uh, certificates goods um, services that are there and they need somehow to be digitalized and already that could be an action for fraud uh, in there and and Chanduka, so so what are what are on that that um, aspect on your chapter what were the, the key challenges in issuing digital assets actually Yes, I think, first of all, the point is uh, looking what is native digital. So if something is native digital, is created already as a digital asset, like uh, a piece of music or, or a, a digital art. This, of course, is born uh, digital and can be uh, with the proper uh, mean transfer uh, to another owner or, or transfer its value to, to someone else. Uh, another situation is when you have a, a real physical uh, asset, like a piece of uh, land or, or a house or something like that. So you have to transfer this uh, piece or create uh, uh, like a, a digital twin which represents that goods and then be able to transact that goods into the digital world, which of course bring a lot of uh, new uh, power or a lot of new option, uh, also from the commercial or, or market standpoint, because goods which before were pure physical can be transacted or can be uh, um, ex can expand their market as well uh, uh, around the world. So this is, brings new, uh, of course, uh, um, chance for, 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 uh, for, for business or for people to uh, uh, have uh, uh, or participate in this, but it brings also new challenges to protect what is behind this good or if the good is properly represented. So for the digital asset, uh, it might be easier uh, to because it's born uh, digital and it can be a, a sign if it's, for example, is uh, born inside a platform which takes care of doing the proper uh, assessment and the proper checks, it can be then uh, fully tracked for a physical good. Of course, uh, right now you have also to deal with local legislation and local rule and uh, implement uh, practice in order to to, because at the end it comes down to who is the owner and uh, where is the good and who is now owning it. So, and for that, of course, you have to to have a proper infrastructure to, to track that. Yeah. Very good. Okay. Well, Natasha, you you were probably the one that that wrote the the chapter that I at least um, understood uh, the, the most little about it because it is really about the hardcore of the of the idea of the security i mean you are a security researcher just recently um uh, finished your master degrees and uh, and uh, and in that cyber security space what what do you see as key challenges for the enterprise space now coming really from the security let's say <laughs> 
Okay, I think like the first uh, big challenge is how to secure the, the key and all the, the cycle of the key. So the generation, the, the use, and um, after that, if we lost the key, the backup. Uh, because um, if an attacker have uh, your, pre your private key, he can use it to do some transaction or say or sign whatever. So I think uh, secure key management was is the most uh, challenging uh, um, challenging in a, in a security way. Then is uh, we want to avoid uh, denial of uh, of service. We want uh, the availability of the blockchain of time. And not that uh, an attacker try to um, to, to uh, I don't have to say that, but to um, yeah, just like the ability of the blockchain to be sure that uh, we have the blockchain available when the, uh, when we want. And uh, finally, another challenge is the privacy to make sure that uh, only that the people who want to access the blockchain have access and not the other people. That is well a good uh, bridge actually over to uh, Moritz and uh, Michel again, because that was core part mm -hmm. of your chapter, uh, the identity, uh, identity and authentication uh, uh, management actually. Um, of the enterprise blockchain. And, and here, I think it, it is as well a key challenge that it, especially in enterprise solutions where you, you know, where actually you have dedicated members in the blockchain that are collaborating to deliver an enterprise uh, joint value chain. Huh? So suppliers and buyers and uh, and 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 probably as well uh, notaries that are that are coming in or intermediaries that do certain certain jobs like harbors or shippers and and and, and so on. So many parties are participating in such enterprise blockchain solutions. And so what 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 would be you know it's the things that you see we would say we need to consider very. Um, as, as very important in the um, identity and access management uh, area. Who wants to take it, Michel or Moritz? Uh, I think I will take it. Or what do you mean, Moritz? Please go ahead. Okay, so I would think that uh, important things is if you have uh, a lot of candidates that as Maurice said uh, earlier, that you have a trust anchor. You have one entity that is mostly central that you can trust. That could be for, uh, if you need some heavy processes like KYC to be sure that one person is the person that it should be. And if you have one central, per, uh, central trust anchor, everyone can correlate with that one to be sure that's the right person. And you can just add more person with the trust anchor. We just have to make sure that the consortium is agrees to that. Mm -hmm. That's very good. Okay, um, so I, I, we just have a question in uh, in the chat. And, uh, and I just wanted to say, if you have a question, this will be an interactive session and the audience should be as well possible to place questions, please type it into the Q&A session and I will then read it out to uh, to the people. And there was a question about uh, uh, were as well antitrust violation issues addressed in the white paper uh, from Johannes. And I, well, I think we have not a dedicated chapter to the antitrust uh, violations uh, there. But um, we, we probably looked at it from, from different different topics. I mean, antitrust could be as well looked at it uh, for, from, from, from different uh, different angles. There could be the, the topic that uh, Gianluca uh, was looking at. Okay, how can we do the antitrust in, in, in capturing and digitalizing uh, digital assets, etc. Uh, but we looked at as well at it from a, from a governance perspective. Um, 
um, because when you when you when you define here um, cybersecurity uh, standards and uh, and um, business rules, for example, in a, in a in a blockchain uh, in an enterprise blockchain, then this needs to be as well uh, defined in a proper way in an uh, in a neutral way for the participants. We heard before from Misha, for example, uh, the the the, the organization model of um, of consortiums, which a lot of enterprise solutions ha have there, and of course there you suddenly start with antitrust. Okay, who, a, a consortium that decides. Okay, who can actually participate in the network and who is not allowed to participate uh, in the network, and uh, how 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 you manage uh, these kind of aspects, and that has been as well ca uh, captured in in a in a chapter. Uh, on governance and how to uh, how to manage actually the governance um, in in an enterprise blockchain solution and uh, and especially there and that is probably even as well important as the antitrust violation uh, risk that you have which is probably not a cyber risk uh, there but of course you have a huge counterparty risk that you need to manage in these uh, enterprise blockchain solutions as well because often in enterprise blockchain solutions, if it is a digital asset, as Gianluca said before, um, uh, you can probably do uh, the transactions really immediately between the different parties. But as soon as you have another good, a physical good that gets exchanged and you have actually the shifting of rights that are um, uh, shifted on an enterprise blockchain solution, then that's where a counterparty risk actually happens because somebody needs to ensure that you are as well really uh, receiving those those physical products at the end. Uh, what are your thoughts on that, Gianluca? Yes, I think uh, this is not an easy question, first of all, and it's also probably uh, part of the setup of this uh, enterprise solution to define who is uh, able to uh, take this uh, uh, rule or, or make the rule how the things are transacted or how the verification of the the goods is uh, is made so probably is uh, is um, yeah part of this uh, uh, situation for uh, as well uh, uh, i mean in, in the industry for example you might also consider to um, integrate that uh, via some uh, uh, tool or some uh, for example if you are looking to to get information on an industrial process you can have some iot which takes the information so this is something that of course is not uh, possible to, to tweak, uh, but yeah, on, uh, on uh, things which uh, rely on an initial uh, physical uh, uh, presence of, uh, of a good or, or of, um, as we said before, a land or a house or, or yeah, a physical asset, of course, right now, uh, probably you need to also deal with the, the, the local legislation and the local authority uh, or involve them in the process to, to make this uh, more, uh, I mean, safe or at least reliable at nowadays i would say mm -hmm. so we need in one way as well a little bit of uh, even in a decentralized network we need uh, some kind of centralized uh, uh, yeah let's say governance uh, structures and and uh, uh, legal uh, backbone actually uh, to make sure uh, which brings me back to you uh, katarina what 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 are the challenges in enterprise blockchain solutions from a from a legal advisor perspective uh, concerning cybersecurity aspects as well do you see that we need to consider um, different they are different uh, challenges basically um one thing uh, is what i started mentioning the right to be forgotten if you go through the gdpr regulation you won't actually find term right to be forgotten is rather, right, um, um, rather the term which is called it every data subject, every of us has a right to that his or her personal data will be erased basically. So they will disappear. And then we have a, one challenge which relates to the, how we make sure on blockchain that the data will be really erased. So is the is erasure basically possible at all? So that's, the, that's not only technical question, but it's also governance and legal question. 
There are in the meantime many um, cases of Court of Justice of European Union which says what could be actually considered, that data are really erased, how you want to make sure that between the, this, those different nodes that it will be really erased on every sim single node. And in relation to this, to, to, to somehow closed um, blockchain um, network, like enterprise network, it's probably easier again to, to, to comply with those regulation and also to find somebody who is responsible for that erasure. But um, they very different outcomes. It does not necessarily has to be erased. It could be put beyond used. It could be anonymized. Um, French legislator has a view that it could be uh, basically the private key might might be destroyed and then we have the, the erasure of data. So it's the one challenge basically that we don't have a common approach how to make sure that the data are actually erased. Second one, we have another issues. Um, let's also let's come back to the question of um, of the antitrust um, issue. I rather would say it was probably a question of competition, not necessarily antitrust, to, to invoke antitrust um, law regulated regulations, it needs a lot. It needs to have a very strong position on the market, it needs to have monopoly, basically situation on the market, but here is the issue on competition or maybe discrimination. Why are we letting one, some certain people to be in, in this permission um, blockchain and certain not? What's the governance, what the conditions? So that's another issue. Another one, all over existing at the moment are financial um, market law related regulations, uh, bank law and security laws, all of kind of, um, you know, whenever you take somebody's money or virtual, as virtual assets in under you power of control, there will be certain regulations invoked uh, which relate to financial market um, authorities and their uh, way how they treat the regulation. We have issues related to copyright laws. We have perhaps one license of use and then the copyright related content is spread to all of on all of the nodes. And then if we have a judgment saying, hey, you need to raise the, 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 the content, then you have a problem us the administrator of blockchain of um, uh, enterprise um, based blockchain to make sure that the content will be deleted on every and single node. So different legal challenges, but it's also very fascinating times we're living now. And uh, let's see what, what we will see um, come next, basically. Yeah, you said a, an important thing with the, the right to be forgotten and uh, which as well brings us to the thing that you have not only the onboarding aspect, which I think we're going to talk in, in a second uh, about it, but we have as well the offboarding aspect into enterprise uh, blockchain solutions. And, and that is something that uh, Michel and Moritz have as well covered in their, in their section, um, that the, the revocation of privilege in, an, in, an, uh, in a blockchain and the offboarding from, uh, from an enterprise blockchain solution um, can be an issue or is an issue that we as well need to take care about uh, cyber securities. And Katarina already mentioned a couple of uh, uh, points that we need to consider. What is your view, Michel or Moritz? Um, uh, what, what else do we need to consider there? What we, what we want to achieve is we want to um, map privileges of the participants um, to individual credentials. Um, to represent, for example, a membership, or that a participant is an insurance, um, a regulated entity allowed to um, uh, sell uh, liability insurances, for example, or um, that a participant is a medical doctor. And we, we want to have these, um, these credentials um, um, for three things. We want to have them to um, be sure about the identity and the authenticity of the counterparty and the, these transactions. Uh, we want to be sure that our counterparty in a transaction is a valid member um, of this uh, enterprise blockchain solution. And we want to be able to um, check if this counterparty has these required privileges, depending on the, the role or roles that this counterparty plays in this transaction. And now, um, what we need, we need a way to, to react to certain scenarios. 
when it comes to um, revoking privileges. Um, the easiest probably is if, if some participant terminates the membership, then we have normally a lot of time to really handle this revocation um, of, of the credentials. Um, another scenario is um, if we have to temporarily revoke privileges, um, say if the credentials of a participant have been compromised. And then of course we have the scenario where we either temporarily or permanently suspend membership Say in the case where um, a participant um, has conducted a, a breach of the governance and um, we have to react to that. And uh, especially in the second two scenarios, we have to be able to, to act fast and to act without the collaboration of that participant. So we have to design the system in a way that we can achieve that, that we can um, make sure that we can, in the transaction, verify the aspects of that and that we can revoke those credentials um, to prevent further harm. And I think you as well, and now that's more to Michel, I think um, you wrote as well that, that for such identity uh, management and authentication of the users in, in um in enterprise blockchain solutions you were referring then to uh, self sovereignty identity ssis and um uh what are there the you know can you quickly explain us a little bit where you see then the benefits of, of using uh, such a solution in enterprise blockchain solutions yeah sure um one thing maybe is uh, you maybe heard of SSI with the EID, the Swiss EID project, where they want to give um, digitized uh, ID card of Swiss people based on SSA principle. Mm -hmm. But in other case, SSA is really a new generation of identity management. Um, and a solution that would make the digitalization easier for everyone. And essentially it's that the identity is now centered around the user. So user represents a digital identity and manage it himself. To make an, an example, it really feels like processes that we already have. For example, for the Swiss passport, if you want one, you go to a government agency, they check your identity, give you your physical passport. But then if you want to show or present your identity, you can give the passport to someone, he checks it and uh, it's all right. Now, if you check with the SSI process, you start exactly the same, go to the government agency, say check your identity, this time you receive your digital passport that you can store on your smartphone. So you have to manage it yourself and you have the power to show to other or not your identity. And if it's the case, you can just open your smartphone and for example, let someone other scan your QR code. The, the main, the first benefit, and that's also one of the novelty is that Unlike federated identities, someone can check your identity without having to contact the government. It's really like in the analog process where you just check the passport. You don't want to call the government just to check if it's really you or not. So with SSI, you can just validate um, identity or a claim without contacting the person that gave it to the user. And secondly, what it's really an important point with SSA that is uh, based with uh, privacy by design is that you can do, uh, you can choose which information you want to share with others. So in case, if you want to check if someone is 18 or more, you have the first possibility to just share that information. You don't have to uh, share every information that is on the passport. So you only share your age. And in addition, you can also ask if a person is over 18, you don't have to send the birth date. So you can just say, is he or she more than 18 years old? Yes, no. And the last benefit that I see is that the protocols of SSI are standardized. Uh, standardized. And 
everyone basically has the same identity resource, which means that integration becomes very easy. If we have an enterprise blockchain solution and you want to add an enterprise and all its uh, employees, you could just whitelist the claim that uh, you are an employee of that new enterprise. And then basically you just added an enterprise to the whole um, enterprise blockchain solution. Or another uh, part, uh, we talked about the uh, right to be forgotten. Maybe some information don't need to go to the blockchain. So you can think of like the, the EID. That's one information that the user can keep by himself. And when, for example, if you want to migrate users from enterprise A to B, the user can just share the data again with enterprise B and revoke the data that it shared with enterprise A. Frederick, I mean, that's a, you, you manage Fortinet, some of really large networks um, in that area. Um, the access and uh, identity management. I mean, that must be a, a, a permanent topic uh, in, your, in, your, in your field. What are your experiences there? And uh, are you as well applying SSI solutions that are successful or what, what do you know? What can you share there? Yeah, uh, yeah. In, in, in my interactions with our customers, of course, uh, access to the network and access to resources uh, is a paramount uh, concern. So we 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 have multiple solutions in our uh, let's say in our in our ammunition here when it comes to uh, protecting access to uh, to confidential data and ensuring the identity of the of the of the of the different let's say different users are accessing the blockchain. Um, big big source of concerns here. Um, now we see also that it's a multi-dimensional problem here. We see also, I wanted to, to discuss in my introduction, I discussed about denial of service. We see, we see also this as a big, big threat when it comes to, uh, to, uh, to enterprise uh, blockchain, because due to the nature of the blockchain, which is a distributed uh, architecture, those, th those architectures are very, very um, ex exposed to denial of service. Maybe I should explain a little bit what it's all about, distributed, distributed denial of service. It's, it's an attack, it's an attack which is flooding uh, with volumes, with packets, the different systems or the different endpoints into the chain, which is slowing down the processing of the transactions in the blockchain. And, and this, is, this is something that we see more and more we have uh, our, our uh, threat intelligence specialist looking at looking at that, and and we see that th those solutions or those or those type of attacks are more and more pre prevalent when it comes to uh, enterprise uh, blockchain for enterprise. Okay, thank you. We have there a couple of uh, questions in 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 the uh, in the Q A section as well, and one is um, well when we when we uh, come back to I mean. Quickly about uh, um, concerning Roberto had a question: Are there any SSI products that that are worth to to know and that that he could play around a little bit with it? So I don't know, Michel, if you can recommend us something. Then you. Yeah, sure. I mean, um, one thing that I didn't mention are also a bit the challenges that come with SSI currently, and that perhaps give a more clear view, but. The components that you have uh, now are mostly fit, fought for prototyping, which is essentially a good thing because you can check um, how does SSA integrate in your process? How will the usability be of your products if you integrate SSA? And how do, uh, do your user accept it? Because it's, it's not similar to the things that we already have. And you have uh, the first um, iteration of standards, as I said, that you can use for prototyping. In Adnovum, we have some parts. Uh, if you want to contact us, we can try to set you up with uh, the components. And you also have uh, wallets that, are, uh, that you can download for the Google Play or the Apple Store 
to play with. Okay. Yeah. Um, then we have another question in in the uh, Q&A session. And please, if you have questions, dear audience, then please, please write them in. And Kieran actually asks, um, uh, who would be, and we come back to the digital identity here, uh, who would be as well uh, uh, liable if somebody was uh, stealing a di di uh, digital identity? Uh, and what would happen then there? And what would be the costs uh, uh, for something like that? And something like that would happen. I know somebody wants to take that question. I will take from the legal perspective, maybe because it's important to to that um, you guys will understand the difference between enterprise blockchain and open blockchain. I put it like this, and the definitions which I which I told you at the beginning. I told you there is somebody who is called data controller. Data controller is the centering organization which is responsible to make sure that we have compliance with data protection related regulations, including security of data. And on the open blockchain, it's very difficult to say who is the liable party, basically, because we have all of those nodes, operator of nodes, and they might be even treated as joint controllers. As though all of, all of them will be liable if such breach in security will happen. Obviously, if, if this is possible to prove that there were lack of, uh, there was not enough security um, in place. Now, when we look on this enterprise, enterprise blockchain, we may think, okay, we have somebody who is making sure that the governance is around one, is within one organization, then we will have one mostly data controller and that person, the one who is organized the whole enterprise blockchain might be keep liable for breach, breach of security in such case. In relation to the costs, I can only say what could be the um, fees, what may be the, what could be the damages. They all, um, in relation to the, to, 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 to the fines, they are um, in GDPR, they, they might be quite high. But um, in relation to, to other costs, let's say the technology related costs, I cannot um, um, comment on, on, on that stuff, basically. Mm -hmm. So perhaps somebody else will take it from here. I mean, the, the well, probably from another angle um, from it, I mean, uh, Natasha, you, 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 your chapter, I mean, you, 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 you talked as well about protecting keys. That was, that was the main, main topic. Uh, and, um, I mean, the key is as, is in some of the use cases, it is really the, the, the one that identifies you. Uh, uh, <laughs> and it is like your, your actually identity in the network that you are allowed to execute a transaction, that you are allowed to, to access certain information. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. And I mean, can you really say? I mean, this the question from Kieran was as well. You know, okay, how can we really make sure protection and who takes the liability? So probably from a technical perspective, if somebody would like to access my keys and breaches an enterprise blockchain's system um, of protecting the keys, uh, how, first of all. What are the kind of measures how you how you really can protect it? I mean, you wrote about multi-sig and multi-party uh, computing in in your document, and and second of all, who, who takes actually the, the the reliability uh, for for that they are then protected when such security measures are implemented? Um, okay, so yeah. Uh as uh, I speak about uh, multi sig and multi signature. Oh, sorry. 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 I just. Um, um, I can hear you and more. That's it. Yeah, you can hear us and you know you're saying something. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Uh, can you just uh, repeat the, the question? Because if... Um... Yeah. I mean, first of all, I mean, the key is like your identity in the network. Yes. And, sure. and the first part of the question was, of course, okay, what kind of measures do you see for protecting 
uh, mm -hmm. the key. I mean, what are the different types? Yeah. Of, you write in your chapter about uh, software-based solutions, hardware-based solutions, or a combination of both. And then the question is, of course, and that comes back to the question of, of, of Kieran a little bit, um, if you have then uh, a breach and somebody somebody is going to steal your, your things, I mean, who would be then liable from a technology uh, perspective uh, about it? <laughs> Okay, so I will start with the two technology the two, two uh, solution that uh, I spoke on the paper, software based and hardware based. So, an um, hardware based key storage is the offline uh, storage option for the the key. Um, it is a physical device that allows you to store uh, your private key, like uh, a USB key or a session or whatever. And when we need to do to sign a transaction, uh, we have to connect the hardware to the to the computer and copy paste the key. Uh, if no, if an attacker get control of your computer, he will not able to steal the private key. Uh, the, I think the hardware uh, base is storage is the most secure storage option, but it will take uh, longer to do the, the to do to sign the transaction. Uh, then the second option is the software base uh, key storage. It's like it's a, an application that will be manage your key. Um, is often is often online which is a dirt for, for the attacker. It will be easier uh, for a knacker to have access uh, to, your, to your wallet because there are like, more doors to uh, enter. Um, but it is uh, easier. Uh, it is um, the software option is, I think, uh, easier and um, it's the best when we do like frequent uh, transaction because we can automate automize uh, the transaction uh, there is like no really like the no not really the best solution because it's uh, uh, like everything else is the matter of compromise like it depends if of the frequency of your transaction the importance and uh, or the parameter. Mm -hmm. um, so now for the second part of the question that who will be in charge in the technic technical uh, point of view if your key are still. Um, that's a, a really good question. And uh, I didn't go in this detail, but I think it will depend on the context. If it is the user that I don't know, like uh, an attacker try to fish, uh, fish uh, a user by, by mail or whatever, and the users uh, respond to the phishing, I think it will. Uh, um, it is the user that uh, is in fault. But if for example, uh, there is a backdoor in the software um, of the storage. Um, the fault will be, for in my point of view, will be for the um, the one that uh, create the software. I mean, you say uh, absolutely right, and that's probably as well a, a question to the entire uh, uh, panel here. Um, what? Uh, uh, I mean, uh, the, the thing is, we have an enterprise blockchain solution. We have certain standards uh, of uh, um, of, of um, how the cyber security protection works. We have rules how we onboard customers. We have rules how we offboard customers. Everything's provided in in in, in a governance uh, model. Um, but then, the, yeah, the question is really. Who is actually the owner of behind enterprise uh, blockchain solutions, and what is the best model uh, for for providing uh, enterprise blockchain solutions? What what's your general thought here to to everybody in the panel? 
uh, on that one. What is the best governance model behind an enterprise blockchain solution from your perspective? Is it the consortium or is it more a democratic uh, setup uh, with multiple uh, votes and multiple design um, and uh, voting uh, uh, mechanisms? What's, what's your thought on that topic? Who's first? Uh I would just start with uh, one thought that I just have is that uh, if you start with a democratic view for the governance, you just could have the risk that if one of the partners really don't agree with what you want and uh, basically is in the minority, could just uh, think of just terminating the partnership and then just uh, going um, away differently from the consortium where to try to find the best uh, average solution for everyone. Mm -hmm. On the other side, consortium tend to then, uh, the, the biggers are overruling the smaller ones as well in, in certain consortium. I don't know if you, uh, who has experience in working with consortiums from you? From, from my point of view, um, openness and um, having very clear rule that in the end um, um, enable all the participants to have uh, equal power in, in, such a, in such a system is something that's very important. Right? We, we heard about uh, antitrust um, questions and, and answers. Um, so, on the one hand, this openness makes it very difficult and sometimes very slow, right? In, in such an, um, and, and such a collaboration, such a system to move for ahead. But I think it's an important piece and it's, it's essential to have that um, as one of the aspects. I may take one if possible. It's very, again, challenging topic. Actually at the crypto, Valley annual conference last October, I guess, or November it was. Um, Fred uh, Gregor from the new city of Cardano was talking a little bit about, not a little bit, a lot about how the Cardano system will work, about the democratization, voting, openness, and everything is great as long as we're not coming to critical points like defense, like weapon, like chemical issues, like now pandemic and so forth and so on. So we have this beautiful approach, openness, let's everybody work, vote on everything. Everybody should have access to everything. But then where it starts, who decides who has access to those critical points and issues? And um, at the conference, the questions, those questions were left open because nobody has solution to that. But I think we all agree in sitting in, in, in the in the Ola or in the room that there must be some different rules which apply to those critical points and um, different rules which apply to the less um, critical issues. And um, I, I also don't have an answer to that, but I think we all agree that it's a valid point that not everybody shall have access to every issue, be it consortium, be it kind of company, be it just simple joint venture, whatever. But they are certain very important topics where probably only very few people shall decide on them. Yes, that is that is. I mean, that is always key a uh, key topic. So we are already at the end of our hour to introduce the the, the document. I would really again uh, thank everybody of you to participate. I mean, it has become quite a quite a condensed um, blueprint in its information, but very broad as well. I mean, we cover in that in that document quite uh, many aspects of the cybersecurity aspects, so membership and identity management, uh, then as well the entire data protect data privacy issue that you mentioned, um, uh, Katarina, then the entire cyber uh, key storage that is uh, key and important. And of course, how you get assets, digital assets, may it be digitally 
uh, produced, may it be as well physically uh, goods behind it, how you get them into the blockchain and out of the blockchain as well again. And then one topic that we have not covered today and that, that Angela's, Angela uh, Blanca um, Sutta was uh, writing um, on it from, the, from, um, uh, from Geneva, she was uh, then uh, talking about interoperability. I mean, that's another key topic about enterprise blockchain solutions. Don't only work with one network, work with multiple networks. Uh, uh, coming there together, and uh, Frederick is heavily nodding. I think that's one of the most difficult. Uh, Indeed, Indeed. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a recurrent challenge here in interoperability. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And last but not least, a, a small chapter about the governance, which is really one of the key things. And I think, um, as well as, and who should know it better as we Swiss, uh, uh, when you have a really democratic system. It is very complex. <laughs> well, in that terms, I would like to thank everybody uh, very much for this uh, for this talk today. And the the the, the document is now published, so um, uh, we can as well now take the next one and and think about the next one that we're going to write. It was really pleasure uh, doing that, and um, I would like to thank everybody for tonight's session and uh, talk soon. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Talk soon.